Hi, you're in the C-Space studio with me, James Kotecki, your host here at CES 2020. And here with us today, Greg Linder, president of GFK Americas and chairman MRI Simmons. Welcome to- It's a pleasure, James. Thank the you. studio, thank you so much for being here. So first, kind of define for us what those two brands are, and just kind of catch everybody up on uh, what you're doing there. Sure, so MRI, MRI and Simmons, uh, came together as a joint venture in February of 2019. So we're coming close to our one year anniversary as a joint venture and it really was a way to bring together two preeminent brands that collect media data, consumer insights, information, psychographics data, and for them they're very complementary services. Mm -hmm. And so it was a way to start a joint venture with those two very well known brands. Um, and Okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, and I said, in recent years, our data has become more relevant to the digital ecosystem through segmentations and through DSPs in order to help people do digital activation. So it's obviously, it's all about data. Um, and, and who are the customers that are getting this data? So the customers are our media mm -hmm. uh, clients that we have, print, broadcast, audio, cable uh, clients, mm -hmm. as well as advertisers, different brands who buy the service and agency clients throughout. It's important that the agencies are users of the data. It helps with the work that gets done by the other media clients that we have. And just to contextualize for the audience, uh, GFK Americas, how does that fit into this too? So GFK Americas is, uh, the way that it works is that the GFK has different regions throughout the world. It's a global mm -hmm. uh, business. The Americas are one region mm -hmm. uh, within that with a different uh, set of products that are part of it. And the joint venture is a large part of the GFK North America business. Got it. Got it. So what kind of insights do you get from this data? I think that's the most interesting thing that a lot of people at yeah. C-Space would be interested to know. Yeah, so one of the things that I think you hear a lot uh, around here, certainly on the media side, is that content is king. And uh, sometimes, to me, it's what's old is also new. Mm -hmm. And so just as a, a little anecdote, um, I remember being a child, uh, uh, sitting with a $5 Westinghouse radio with an earpiece that I would have under the pillow so that way I could listen to a New York Met game at night mm -hmm. and uh, my parents wouldn't hear me up until 11 o'clock listening to the Met game. So fast forward uh, 30, 40 years and I have children that are sitting there listening to a Met game only using a device that's maybe 100 times more costly than my $5 Westinghouse radio with earbuds that probably cost more than the rent that my parents paid for the apartment. They're listening to the Met game on the radio. The unfortunate thing is that the result that they had when I was a kid and the result of the games as they were children were the same results. So. But I guess you can't really blame them for, for using technology in that way. And so, is that what you're finding? Do you, do, you, do you split the data up by kind of demographics and find that, yeah. I mean, cause one thing that I've always kind of felt about a lot of the success of YouTubers is that they're targeting like teenagers and tweens who can't watch that stuff in the main room, so they kind of watch it in their bedrooms when their parents aren't watching. <laughs> yeah, so we do collect information from uh, from a, an adult in the household, and that adult does tell us what it is that they're doing from a media perspective. Mm -hmm. We also have kids and teen studies for which we get from the same uh, same households information about the teens and the, and the kids and what it is that they're doing on different media and their consumer uh, behavior as well. So yes, the data is uh, demographically driven, the data is psychographically driven, and that's what helps create different segments within and the database. And define psychographics a little bit more. So it's just to, to, to be able, let's say, lifestyle information. What is mm -hmm. it that makes you different or a group of people to be different mm -hmm. than another group mm -hmm. of, of people? What are their feelings on different types of batteries of questions, whether it's environmental questions or whether it's media-related questions that they have? And from that, you're able to draw segments. Those segments then can be looked at with all your media and your consumer behavior insights as well. And how are you collecting all this data? So that data gets collected in a multitude of ways. Uh, and for the MRI study that we have, it's one where you actually still go door to door to collect information with an area probability sample, uh, very high representation of what the, uh, what the country is. So if you're able to look at that data, you would see something that would mirror the country. So it's someone yeah. with an iPad, for example, walking yeah. up to a door, ringing yes. the doorbell, and, and hoping they answer and then asking them some questions about their media consumption. That, that's habits. correct, to yeah. a randomly selected uh, um, household and then a random respondent within that household. Huh, and, and, and why do it that way? That sounds like an old school way to do it, but maybe that's the best way to get certain kinds of answers. Well, well one, one of the things that uh, should be remembered is that in an age of large data or big databases, it's important to have information that, be, that can be considered truth sets. Mm. And when you have information which you're collecting with a lot of rigor, 
around that information and it's something that can be trendable over time and the demographics match the population, it gives people a comfort that mm -hmm. there is a true set that they can work with. And as you're working with digitally activated information, to have seed data that has that type of a value to it is really incredibly important. And do you adjust for the fact that people might not be completely truthful with some stranger coming to the door and asking them about all their media consumption habits? Well, yeah, there might be some guilty pleasures I'm not willing well, to yeah, admit to. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm sure that there are some things that people are less prone to, to say, but what you find out is when you go door to door and you're able to sit down and look eye to eye to the respondent through an interviewer that's gone through a whole lot of training, you're able to break through that and there's a bond that forms between the interviewer and the respondent. I'm talking to Greg Linder right now. He is the chairman of the MRI Simmons Joint Venture. Um, let's talk about privacy concerns. Yes. Um, so you've collected all this data. What do, you, what do you tell the people when you're at the front door? And then what do you actually do with the data as far as <laughs> privacy? Well, I should say that privacy is an essential cornerstone to what it is that we do as a business. So for MRI Simmons, um, if we did not take care of the privacy concerns, we would not be able to mail questionnaires to respondents and have them return it. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be able to go door to door to households and be able to have them feel comfortable about giving us the information about uh, the economics and the education and all the other detailed information ends up being collected. So it's essential from that end. If we ever broke that bond, it would end up impacting what it is that we could deliver to our mm -hmm. clients. So we take great pride in what we do. We have both internal and external audits that are done on the systems and we have investments that are made throughout the business to make sure we take care of that. We also integrate our data with other data sets and there's a lot of care that's taken to ensure that the information that would be PI data ends up being left out of any of those transactions and obviously with what's going on with California and the CCPA it's important that we stay on top of that because we know the concerns that both respondents and bus businesses yeah. have around privacy. And do you have an example of how one of your clients in media, for example, might use this data to make a decision or do something that they wouldn't otherwise do if they didn't have this information? So, so the information can be used if you have an audience estimate, the number of uh, people that read an average issue of a magazine, you're able to use that information in order to determine how you might charge for the advertising mm -hmm. that ends up being within that. Yep. So it's a way to use that information in a quantitative fashion, and then there's also a qualitative aspect that radio networks or cable networks or broadcast would be able to use the information and then it's for decision making on the brand side of the business when they take a look at the data they're able to look at people that might buy their own brand as well as people that are you know looking at other brands and it gives them what's hot what's not yeah you know, marketers have so much data, and obviously it's to their benefit largely, but it also makes their job very difficult and very complicated. Is, it, is, it, is there a sense that it's just harder to be a marketer today? Because if you could go back and promise marketers all this data in an era before they had it, they would salivate, right? But then once they get it, how do they know how to apply it? How do they know what to do with it? It seems like it's just getting more challenging, not less. No, that's, that's a great question, and certainly one of the reasons for the joint venture that we had that was MRI Simmons was to bring together uh, the rigor of the data and also to have new platforms that we're able to uh, roll out to our users. And it makes it easier for them to work with that information. And you know, the intent is to be able to use machine learning and AI in order to help clients make a decision about how to work with the data and not just look at things in a descriptive fashion, but to be able to look at it in a predictive analytic way in the future. So it enables them to get different uses out of the data. But you're right, it's a very complicated you know, world as far as all the different yeah. data. And we try to differentiate what we do with the business Business, again, by having that truth set of data that people can feel very confident with. So speaking of AI, look in the crystal ball for me and tell me what's going to be happening with AI in five years that, that I'm going to be able to apply AI to your data and get what kind of insight that I can't get today. If I can do that, I could probably <laughs> be out at the casino. Sure. Uh, but uh, it's cer certainly um, we have to take cues from our users. As they're working with the data sets that we have and with the machine learning that we're working with them on, we have to take cues from them as to how to make it more actionable for them, how to make the data sing more mm -hmm. uh, for the users that the uses that they have for the information. So I think we're going to use our technologists, our data scientists, um, work with our clients. So we have a lot of client um, 
um, groups that we, uh, uh, that we work with in order to make sure that we get the input from them uh, to provide the uses of the data and to expand on our consumer platforms that we have. And by focusing on the data, you may be focusing on exactly the right challenge for the moment, right? Because I think a lot of people try to do AI, ML initiatives and then find out that the data wasn't as good as they thought. Yeah. But if you're able to kind of control the quality of the data and then apply AI to it, you may be actually better off having that, I don't know, closed ecosystem and, or whatever you want right, to call and, it. And that's how we talk to our clients yeah. about the data. It really is the truth set. It's used mm -hmm. as the foundation for other things mm -hmm. that may, they may want to do because as people work with data more, yeah. they're looking to integrate more data sets. And as you're integrating that information, you have to make sure that you have truth sets as part of that, as part of the foundation of that data. Otherwise, the decisions you make may not be the right decisions. Um, GFK, as a, as a company, has been around for 85 years. What stays the same as technology continues to change? Uh, we talked about it, quality of information certainly needs to, to be there. Uh, consultancy, uh, uh, work in, in order to make sure that when clients have questions about the information, we have the people who have the expertise around Having the a human on the other sense. end of the phone to and talk and to you about all this. It's important yeah. to do that and it's important to go visit you know, our clients and to look at them face to face and to make sure that we have you know, the, yeah. right, uh, the, the right type of uh, analytics that we, can, that we can use for them. Okay, one more crystal ball question, a little more nearer term to close this out. 2020 will be the year of blank. Uh, 2020 is unlikely to be different than other years relative <laughs> to making sure that you're able to innovate and to constantly look at ways that uh, you're working with, uh, with, with data sets that you're able to innovate and to, because what you think is the most important thing in January 2020 may not be the most important thing in July of 2020. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure that you're, that you're going through the innovation within your business and to stay up to speed on that innovation. So 2020 is the same as 2019 because things are continuing to change all continuing the time. Continuing to change all the time, that's <laughs> okay. correct. Well, Greg Linder, President of GFK Americas, Chairman of MRI Simmons, Joint Venture, thanks so much for joining us here in the C-Space It's a pleasure, studio. thank you very much for having me here. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us here in the C-Space studio as well. I'm James Kotecki, your host here at CES 2020. Stay tuned because more great conversations are just ahead.